Hello again. So now we have our first lecture. We're going to be discussing what is horror. Uh, for some of you, this may seem obvious. For others, not quite so much. So we're going to start with our question, what is horror? How do you define horror? How do you understand horror? And these are not uh, mutually exclusive ideas. So when we look for a definition of horror, what is it? Um, one example is Merriam-Webster's definition. So it's, <clears throat> it's a noun. It's a painful or intense fear or dread and dismay, astonishment. It gives place to horror. Um, you know, the idea of you can see horror on people's faces. It's an intense aversion. It's repugnance, right? And so you also talk about the quality of inspiring horror. So it's something is repulsive or horrible, right? Something that inspires disgust, how all of these things are connected. In terms of horror film, which is the subject of this class, we're really interested in the connection between um, how we define horror, but what is this thing that is horror film? What is it doing? And sort of you can look at it and say, okay, they're inspire, it's inspiring fear, disgust, all of these things are also connected, right? And so <clears throat> a horror film is designed specifically to elicit fear. It's supposed to be scary, or it's supposed to be shocking and disturbing. So even when it's funny, it still does those, it still is shocking in some way. Um, and so we're gonna look specifically at the influences of horror. And so we talk about the history of horror. Um, we talk about horror is, doesn't come out of the blue, right? It's connected to all of these other forms of thinking, right? So it, it finds its roots in religion, in mythology, in art, theater, and literature. Uh, to just a few examples, uh, religious examples, right? So Christian tradition uh, designates heaven and hell, this idea that, that if you're bad or you do horrible things, you'll end up in this sort of fiery place. The, the concept of demons and devils comes from Christianity. Um, mythology, right? So you go back to Greek mythology, you look at Hades and the underworld and where all the dead souls live. But also characters like Medusa, right, with her crazy head of worm of snakes that will freeze a man, turn him into stone with one look. And you see these, these theological and religious interpretations in art. Uh, another character uh, to, to sort of think of is the Jewish uh, construction of the golem, right? The idea that you can make a man out of mud and that this man will do your bidding. And so this, this sort of monstrous protector of the Jews. Uh, and we'll see this sort of man creating these monsters throughout the semester. When we're talking specifically about theatrical and literary influence, we're really sort of looking at the influence of Gothic literature, right? So you have the, th the big three in literature. You have Mary Shelley, Robert Louis Stevenson, and Bram Stoker um, as in terms of sort of framing Gothic literature in the, in the 19th century, right? So previously, before that, in the 18th century, you see the introduction of Gothic literature with uh, writers like Anne Radcliffe, um, her Mystery of Adolfo from 1794, any number of Edgar Allan Poe stories, and we'll see um, some of that in one of the films you have to screen, is just a clip, an excerpt that's, that's been discovered by Alice de Blachey, uh, her version of in the pendulum. Okay, so to talk about sort of Gothic literature as a whole, we're interested in what is it that makes Gothic literature, that makes horror literature different, and horror film, different from other genres, right? And so when we talk about genre, we're looking at ways to classify something that we're studying. So you have a bunch of examples, and you look at the ways in which they have, they have things in common, whether it's stylistics, it's it's thematics, characters, settings, all of these things. And in Gothic literature, we're really interested in setting has an important place, right? So Gothic stories tend to be set in 
in decaying castles, in decaying manors, towers, medieval structures, these places that are sort of almost forgotten and falling apart. Um, and there's a, usually, a, there is often a contrast between sort of a, that decaying location in the modern world and the juxtaposition that happens when you bring those two together. So one of the other things we talk about is, so the kind of setting that's established by the by those locations right and so the idea is that it's about creating this ominous atmosphere gothic literature often brings together the supernatural threat um, combined with eroticism right so this sort of juxtaposition it's scary but sexy at the same time um it, the villain in gothic literature tends to be violent, sexually predatory, and male. Um, the victim tends to be female, right? She's usually um, meek, mild, um, sexually naive, all of these things, right? And so all of these things come together to sort of, sort of give us a picture of gothic literature. Um, so when we're talking about the the big three specifically we're talking about mary shelley's um, frankenstein right from 1890 sorry a 179 nope, mary shelley's 1818 so it helps us record remember so mary shelley's uh frankenstein from 1818 and so frankenstein is really about sort of the problems inherent in man's mastery or attempts at mastery over nature, man playing God. And so what happens when, when, when we're in that situation and the problems that arise, right? Our own, our, our own hubris comes, becomes our destruction. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's uh, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from 1886 deals with the doppelganger, right? It deals with this sort of split personality, the alter ego. So building on psychoanalysis, sort of what happens, um, are, are we just one kind of person or are there two sides to the person? Or is there a good side and a bad side? And what happens when that bad side, that alter ego runs rampant? Um, and finally, we have Bram Stoker's uh, Dracula from 1997, sort of at the end of the, the, this 1987, sorry, 1897, get my dates right. So in Bram Stoker's Dracula introduces us to vampire, the vampire, um, and the vampire is this sexually charged character. Uh, I remember seeing uh, Frank Langella's Bram's Frank Langella's Dracula for the first time when I was in high school, and just being blown away because I had never thought of vampires as sexy. And then boom, there he was, and he was amazing. Um, that in Anne Rice's novels, of course, interviewed the vampire, made vampires very sexy. So, but the idea of, of the vampire really pits this sort of supernatural force against modern rationality. How do you justify and, and bring together those two disparate images? Um, finally, we'll look at sort of precursors to contemporary horror film. And the person I'm going to introduce you to, George Méliès, is not typically, you wouldn't necessarily look at his films and think, oh yeah, he's a horror director. But it, his films are important because of what they did, because they showed at a time in early cinema, they showed sort of the possibility of cinema as a means of transforming and distorting reality. And in that sense, they were horrific. They're also horrific in the sense that um, the scholar Tom Gunning talks about the cinema of attractions, which really sort of took place in the late 1890s, early 1900s. And it, when we talk about cinema of attraction, we talk about this sort of where it's where the it's the it's the shock and the attraction that becomes really fascinating, right? And that that become popular, and that this idea that that we watch these these films and in some way they're shocking to us, and it's it's cathartic, right? It sort of slows one down in this new modern world and sort of numbs you to the to the to the everyday shocks that you that you interpret, um, and the idea that. It wasn't just you didn't go to the films, you went to see this special thing that was happening, right? And another example that I'll post, I could post for you later, um, one of the popular Edison films from the early 19, 
sorry, late 1890s is um, Electrocuting an Elephant, which is a film that literally shows you the electrocution of an elephant. And um, it, it, it is quite shocking, but it was also extremely popular. And it's not like they electrocuted the elephant for the film. Uh, Edison just knew that this was happening. And so he sent a crew out and they recorded it, became hugely popular. Um, so we'll go back to George Milliers because Milliers is actually using film to create the attraction, to show something that's unusual. And he's really interested in, so Milliers started his career as a magician, right? So he didn't, he, didn't come to film from the beginning, he came to film from magic. And he had a theater uh, where he performed regularly called the Le Théâtre Robert Houdin. Uh, my French is horrible. So like the theater Robert Houdin, right? So he's interested in sort of magic and its potential, its performative aspect. And magic is this, again, magic itself is, this, is, a, is an attraction. It's shocking. It's, it's supernatural. It, we don't understand it, right? And so he, when Millier saw a film for the first time, he said, hey, I could use that to record my performances. And along the way, you know, rumor has it that one of the things that happened is he's recording one of his performances. And the camera got jammed in, in the, the film got jammed in the camera. He stops. He, he fixes the camera, he goes back to film again, and what the horse and cart that was in the frame had disappeared, had, wasn't there anymore, but he kept filming. And then when he watched the film later, right, so this is at a period when they weren't editing, they weren't putting together two pieces of film. Milliers, when he watched it later, he realized that he had inadvertently made the horse and cart disappear, and voila, in-camera editing becomes a popular pastime. And so he learned early on that he could do this. In addition to this, one of the other things that he plays with is superimposition, where he would, re he would film something, crank the camera, and then rewind, and then film it something else again, either in the corner, or he could, he could have like dreams, etc. So here are a couple films that sort of are exemplary of this sort of shocking attraction aspect of Melies's films. So the first film is Terrible Night from 1896. And I'm gonna talk during the film. Right, so what you're seeing now, the bug is a superimposition, right? But the idea that you could do this with cinema um, was something extremely unique and terrifying. I mean, imagine watching something for the first time and all of a sudden, oh my God, there's a giant bug, right? What is he gonna do with this? What's gonna happen? See, now it's actually a prop, not a superimposition. Okay, very short, um, right? So short and sweet to the point, nothing terribly unusual, but just the idea that you could show with this film, you could, you could show something that was shocking and, and, and disturbing, right? Um, and this also then becomes connected to the supernatural, right? So not just could you have things that magically appear, but you could also have supernatural uh, events happening, right? So here's the apparition from 1903. And there are a lot of films from this time period that deal with this sort of dreamscape or nightmare that happens, uh, ghosts appearing, sort of this fascination with the parlor trick and the supernatural makes its way into cinema. And Melies was, was a really big proponent of that. Terrified, right? So the cam the candles miraculously moving across the table. So 
See, and again, this ability of cinema and the in-camera edit to, to change the size of something in a room, right? So what it does is it, it gives you the sort of the poltergeist look where there's something creating all these bizarre things, making all these bizarre things happen that the man has no control over, right? That are just happening of their own accord and it's terrifying. And this sort of establishes the connection that we'll find later on between horror and comedy, right? The idea that something that, that can, be, can be horrific, that's shocking, can also make us laugh, right? Um, playing on that trope. And of course, no Melies film is complete without a scantily clad woman who turns into a ghost. And keep in mind, sort of the acting style is, is really sort of indicative of, of Melies and this kind of filmmaking where it's, again, it's meant to be a trick. He's trying to get the audience excited and wound up. And so there's a high energy style of pantomimic, pantomimic action, right? So it's not naturalistic acting. We don't get that until much later in film history. Um, so that's something to keep in mind too. Okay, go back to our film. So now we're, this is the, de this is a later Melies film again. This is the devil and the statue. And Melies is famous for his devils and his imps. Uh, they appear everywhere. There's a black imp in his, his sort of seminal trip to the moon. Uh, on, on the moon, the, the astronomers run into all these little moon devils, right? Who they can, they can dis dispel with a, a bonking them on the head with a with an umbrella, right? They can make the devils go away. But the devils are terrifying. Um, so much so that uh, pe there was concern about, about the influence of Melies' films on children. So when I was in graduate school, I was doing research on um, Los Angeles as a film exhibition space. And one of the things I actually discovered were there were there was a group of little old ladies from Pasadena, um, and they were very interested in sort of the moral implications of cinema on uh, children, and especially not just children, but unaccompanied young women in the movie theater, right? And in one of their complaints to the Pasadena newspaper, they were complaining specifically about these films that had these devils in it. And there was the assumption that by showing the devils in film, it would make children and young women devil worshippers, right? Um, and so this is, this is sort of emblematic of that kind of film. Um, the other imp interesting thing about this particular film is we already see this sort of threat of female uh, it's sort of the way in which the devil or the supernatural force threatens sort of female virginity or just you need, you need to protect sort of womanhood, right? And so how do you do that? Right? You let in the guy who's going to protect her from the devil. Of course, he doesn't actually protect her. The woman, the angel protects her, uh, but you get the idea. Okay, so that's all for now. Uh, we'll uh, see. I'll see you again later. Have a great day.